right, so good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another broadcast with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world through over 40 live, free, monthly, interactive broadcasts. I want to say a huge thank you to all our teachers for joining us as we continue to showcase and celebrate such amazing people and places around the globe. And as hopefully most of you know, you can check out everything that we do on our YouTube channel. Over 2,500 past broadcasts there featuring some of the coolest stories from across planet Earth. Now today I am particularly excited because we are diving in with a new program partnership series in conjunction with the amazing team at Frontiers for Young Minds. I'm going to be bringing up this website a whole bunch through the program. Program, but I really encourage you to check out the amazing work they do there to highlight and showcase the world of science with kids like you. I'm about to bring in Laura Anderson. She is their Director of Strategic Partnerships, Programs, Outreach, and more. She's going to highlight a little bit about what Frontiers for Young Minds is all about before we dive in with today's topic. So without further ado, Laura, if you want to unmute your mic and come on in and join us, you are good to go. Tell us about Frontiers for Young Minds. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse, and hi, everybody. Um, and Laura, as Jesse said, I'm calling you from Switzerland today, which is where our headquarters is based. Um, Frontiers for Young Minds, what we're all about um, is science that is accessible for everyone. So you've probably heard about open access, but we like to give intellectual access. So it means that anybody can read this amazing science anywhere in the world. So we're fully free. We're all online. So wherever you are in the world, you can browse our stuff. We've got over 1,100 articles now published, and we've got over 35 million views and downloads from over 230 countries. So we really are talking to everybody worldwide. And we also have it in multiple languages. So of course, we publish mostly in English, but we also have Hebrew, Arabic, and next week we're launching Mandarin Chinese, which we're really excited about. And best of all, every article we publish is written by top researchers, including Nobel Prize winners. We have several of those who are working with us, but it's then reviewed by young people like you, aged eight to 15. So working with the guidance of science mentors in 64 countries, you guys all help us ensure that everything we publish is fun to read. And that's it, that's our mission. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much, Laura. Thanks for joining us as our kickoff of our four-part Frontiers for Young Minds series. I'm going to highlight again kids.frontiersin.org if you want to find out more about the amazing work they do, and I'll be sharing that link with all of our registered classes when we are done today's broadcast. Now, my birthday was just a few weeks ago, and I got my favorite present ever, something I've been looking forward to for years now, which is BBC's The Green Planet. I live for stories of the natural world, and particularly botany, which is something that, again, we hear plants, sometimes it's not quite as exciting as dinosaurs or space or other stuff, but the series and today's program will highlight that that is absolutely not the case. We are joined live by Professor John Van Stan from Cleveland State University, who is an eco-hydrologist. What on earth is an eco-hydrologist? Well, you might get a little bit of an inkling from the fact that he runs the Wet Plant Lab, and you can also check out his Twitter handle below. I'm so excited to bring, us in to bring him in to kick off this series, and so without further ado, John, Freshly back from, by the way, one of the most amazing places on this planet in Costa Rica's cloud forest, which I'm oh, eternally jealous for. Uh, welcome to the broadcast and exploring by the seat of your pants, man. Uh, thank you, Jesse. And hi, everyone. And uh, thank you, Laura. And thanks to, thank you guys and your uh, respective organizations for making this happen. Uh, I'm excited to meet you all. And I hope that the, um, the weather wherever you are is good. And by that, I mean rainy or stormy, or foggy, or whatever, snowy, although it's a bit late in the time of year for that, because I love storms. And here in um, Cleveland, Ohio, it's usually stormy. In fact, today it is uh, foggy and a little bit drizzly, which is my, fine, my favorite kind of weather, because um, my research in the wet plant lab is to look at one fundamental question, which is what happens when plants and water meet during storms. And this question is a weird question for a lot of people because oftentimes uh, folks don't go out in the rain. Uh, they see rain or they see a storm uh, announcement and they think I'll stay inside and do a puzzle. <laughs> so they're not even out there looking at the, uh, looking out the window at the storm, right? But um, I think that that question has a lot of like interesting answers for uh, not just now, but for the future because we can see what happens when plants and water meet during storms, if that has an impact for, say, soils, or how much of that rain gets returned back to the atmosphere. So that will all change with climate in the future. 
but also we look for um, what we call biosignals. We look for signals in um, the rock record beneath our feet that were left there by ancient forests as a result of their long-standing interactions with rain or snow or what have you. Um, I'm so gonna I'm just going to interrupt really, really briefly. For the first time in literally 800 broadcasts of StreamYard, it kicked me out right after I did my intro. So I just came back in. So if you're trying to share a screen, um, it's not sharing yet. And if you hadn't started that yet, that's totally fine. But I'm just letting you know it's not up right now. <laughs> All right. Yeah, no worries. No worries. In fact, I was just about to say that I'll go ahead and share my screen here. I've got a presentation for you all. And... Um, Oh, great. Yes. <laughs> I see in the chat that Laura's posted the koala stuff, which I'll actually be going next month to Australia to the Yu Yangs to work on uh, why koalas give certain bark a tree lick uh, a licking. But they don't give all bark a licking. They will literally move trees when it rains to drink uh, something specific. All right. But here we are. Here we so are. Today, oh, is it looking good? It's looking great, man. Go for it. Awesome. So like this guy, uh, that's usually what my job is. Being an eco-hydrologist can have a variety of different ways of acting in the world. And for me, it's thinking in the rain. I like to call it my shower thoughts. Um, and basically, when we look at the stuff in the rain, uh, we can get an idea of um, certain plant interactions that might be really important under really small time scales, right? So most field research is done when it's dry because it's easier to get out there. Um, and so this provided a nice opportunity for me to form my wet plant lab. Um, but I go in the rain during storms, uh, in the forest during storms, and I'm usually the only one out there. And people always ask me if I see any mystical creatures. Um, and then I ask them, well, those pictures, those grainy pictures of the uh, mystical humanoid beasts, have you ever zoomed in on them and tried to see what they really look like? And you'll find out that they're just wet scientists wandering around the forest in a time that no one else is there looking for uh, fascinating findings and new discoveries. <laughs> I, I played with a couple of Sasquatch pictures before I found the right one. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, so when you do walk into, when you walk into a, a wet forest and you run into a wet scientist, people oftentimes ask us, why are you even studying, uh, these things in the rain? And there's all types of reasons why, uh, stormy forest processes really matter. Um, for, first off, of course, the hydrologic cycle, all water goes down and eventually goes back up, right? It's cycled, uh, throughout the earth. And any water that falls from the sky, be it rain or snow, generally tends to fall over a forest canopy or a crop canopy or some kind of plant. And thus, most of the rain and snow that falls on the Earth's surface, well, the terrestrial one, not so much the ocean, of course, right? It's the first step in that droplet of water or that snowflake's journey to the sea and back again. And so if we don't understand what happens in that first step, we might have a lot of error in uh, the rest of our estimates of the water cycle. So being out in the wet forest really helps us to understand our water budgets um, in, say, a, a regular urban area, for example, or any place where we want to better plan our, our water management. Of course, water nourishes things. So as this water drains through the canopy, it is nourishing life in the canopy. And I like to highlight my collaboration with illustrators. And these are illustrations from my illustrator buddies, Tyus Seda and Freddie Siloy. We try to uh, make some really beautiful, striking illustrations to show some of these wet forest processes. And here we see how a forest can capture fog on the left or rain on the right and drain it around and, and support plants that will live on what I call the bark side of the forest. And here we see beautiful plants that we would typically put in our houses, right? There's even some that are common, we call bromeliads. That's like the ones with little pools of water in them and stuff. And not only then does this water nourish these plants that live on plants, but 
if you look in that little water pool, you might find animals that are also uh, being supported by wet forests. And not just amphibians, those are kind of the most obvious animals that are supported by wet forests, but you can see larger um, charismatic megafauna, as we call them, also relying on wet forests. So that link that Laura provided about koalas giving bark a licking, well, there you go. That's one of the photographs of a koala licking bark because water is draining down that bark surface and the trunk has literally been turned into a tap for this thirsty koala. Before we saw this, we believed that koalas, for the most part, did not drink water in the environment. Indeed, we thought koalas got most of their hydration or the hydration they needed from eucalyptus leaves, but now we uh, are beginning to rethink even what we understand about koalas and their uh, behaviors and physiology. Not only that, but they also transport, these water uh, processes transport things. They act as like a highway. I like to call them a hydrologic highway. They carry things like viruses. They carry things like bacteria. And they carry insects, sometimes carcasses. Sometimes the insects have died before they join this hydrologic highway. Um, but there are also living spores from fungi and wormy little things called nematodes, which can do all types of stuff like cycle nutrients in the soil or even infect a cricket and uh, cause it to do crazy things or eat things. So those nematodes are important. And the uh, meme-worthy water bear, the tardigrades you can see in there, tardigrades are also transported from the canopy uh, down into the soils by uh, rain scouring these surfaces. And then it also matters economically. Uh, here we basically put all of our trees into, uh, into piggy bank shapes because the water that they store saves us a lot of money. The water they store does not become runoff and thus it doesn't run off the land and go into our stormwater management system. So there's pipes underground that handle all this extra water in places where we don't have a lot of trees. When we have trees, they can prevent a lot of that moisture from getting down to the ground and running off. And that saves us money on how uh, much we have to maintain our stormwater system it saves us money on how much water we have to store in certain places because we can make our storage smaller. And this can come to millions to hundreds of millions of dollars per year saved by simply having trees and having it rain on them and having it look nice. And so there's many, many reasons. But the most common question I get when I'm talking to kids about what I do is generally, okay, that's all cool, but you know, what can I see when I'm on a rainy walk? You're out there a lot of the time, and surely you must see something. Even if you don't see Sasquatches, you must see some interesting stormy phenomena. And indeed, I do. And so for the rest of the talk, I figure I'll take you through a few photographs that I've taken while wandering the wet forest and show you what kind of scientific insights we've gained from just curiosity about something like colorful droplets. Here we're looking at crepe myrtles, basically in Savannah, Georgia. And these crepe myrtles, it's just been raining on them, and you might notice something about the droplets that are hanging from them. They have a nice amber glow. Well, one has a nice reddish glow as well. Well, that's because the sun is trying to shine through that droplet. But guess what? There's neat little chemicals, most of them natural, some of them not, but most of them natural from the plant. And those little chemicals that are in there that are dissolved, they absorb some of that light. And when they absorb it, they change the color of what we see in these droplets. And so the color of the droplets tell us something about what's in that water. And we can certainly tell that there is a lot of stuff in that water. For example, you can see a nice clear droplet on the picture uh, on the what, left of the screen, perhaps you are right. 
that nice clear droplet doesn't have much in it probably, but if you look at some of those droplets that are really dark, that usually means that they have a lot of whatever is absorbing light. You wanna hear a fun word? The light absorbing compounds, we call them chromophoric. Chroma being light and phoric, right? Being this absorbance here, but chromophoric light uh, compounds. So we've gotten uh, a lot of insights into how trees cycle carbon. They lose a lot more than we think because a lot of this is actually carbon. And I'm happy to answer questions, by the way, at the end about any of these processes that we see and any processes that you've seen that you'd like to share with me. I've also noticed streams on the stems. And this, I think, is one of my favorite pictures of what I call essentially a, a stem flow stain. So as branches capture rain or ice melts, it starts to drain down and reach the stem. It drains underneath all the branches and then it hits the stem. And because it also has a lot of that stuff that colored these droplets, it's very colorful too. And so it stains the bark, a dark, rich color to say stem flow was here. And so we can find in these cases where these streams on the stems appear during storms, we can find them pretty easily sometimes. And in this case, where uh, we're on an island full of plants that like to live on plants, you can see that the plants like that stem flow area. They want to be in the stream going down that stem. Also, the streams that go down stems, they can be all different colors. Again, we're coming back to those compounds that absorb light. Well, those compounds will color the stem flow too. And what we found is that different trees make different uh, color or flavors of tree tea, in a sense. In fact, you can see that smooth trees like the beech, that gray bark there, uh, it doesn't seem to color the water very much. It just lets water drain over it. However, if you get rougher and rougher bark, uh, or if you get a lot of ferns in your way, like in that other picture, you can get some really rich stem flow, really enriched rain, essentially. But to me, it turns from tree tea around the English oak and the bird cherry by the black locust. I'm thinking it looks more like tree coffee. And uh, that makes sense because I guess coffee is a tree derived product, too. All right. Another crazy thing that I like to see are little lakes on leaves because leaves are funky, right? They, they don't want water to sit on them for very long. So this kind of thing is actually kind of unusual, but it happens a lot in, in, in like one leaf here or one leaf there. I mean, unusual spatially. Um, but the leaves are covered in a, in a wax that uh, allows water to flow off because water is also a place where diseases like to live and water likes to transport diseases. So many leaves have very thick waxy coverings that allow that water to fly right off. But in this Brussels sprout, for example, um, its leaf is all wrapped up as it's trying to create Brussels sprouts and it accumulated an enormous globule of water. In fact, that's a very big droplet of water. If it were to fall out of there, it would probably fall apart. It would not look like a single raindrop. But um, you can see this in all types of canopy elements. You can see it even in little acorn cups, or there are some lichens sometimes like that will absorb a lot of water and you can then see water kind of sitting on top or even weird little fungi caps. So there's enough of these little lakes that they're not just on leaves, they're on all types of things, which goes to show that the canopy can store a lot of this rainwater. Another one that's fun, I love watching insects freak out in the storm. This is one of my favorite examples of insects freaking out when it rains on them. Uh, this is a bamboo dwelling ant. It has a whole colony in bamboo, which is hollow on the inside. And so when it rains and the bamboo drains all that rain down its outsides, uh, sometimes it flows into the holes that they've made and it starts flooding their colony. So the ants, these ants, start freaking out and they've done something kind of crazy and kind of gross at the same time. They communally pee together. 
They run over to where the water's coming in and they all drink a little bit of it, run to the outside and pee it somewhere else. That's literally what this ant is doing. Um, and that looks like a small amount of communal peeing there because it's one ant. But when you've got hundreds, sometimes thousands of ants communally drinking and then peeing somewhere else, you have quite a, a, an effective flood control. <laughs> oh, I love that example. Also, um, you can find insects that start huddling under branches. They don't like the rain. And so, well, some do. Let's uh, Some insects do love the rain and use it quite well. But the ones that freak out, they'll hide under under little branches or bark flakes. And um, these, these bugs aren't probably doing it, but some bees will actually hide and then vibrate together and huddle because that gives them more heat, right? Another reason that insects freak out when it rains is because when you get wet, you can start to get colder. And that's primarily because even in the storm, you've got a little breeze here and there, and that evaporation just kind of strips heat from your surfaces, from your skin, from the exoskeleton of these insects. And so they, they huddle together and they vibrate to make themselves warmer. And I'd also like to highlight that we can see stuff that you wouldn't really think you could see with the naked eye. We can even see signs of the microscopic life that's going on and doing things inside a forest soil, for instance. So here is an example of bacteria. Now, we're of course not looking at bacteria with this picture, but if we look at the water, it looks like there's an oil sheen. Well, if you were to go up and touch that oil sheen, by the way, this is a, this is a natural forest there's no oil leaks around here. So if you were to look at this, you would be pretty confused who dumped oil here, you might ask yourself. But if you tapped that oil sheen with your finger, it would actually break apart like a bunch of tiny little crystals under on a nice skin, uh, thin skin over top of that water. And that's because it's not oil. It's actually little iron um, oxidized minerals because you've got basically bacteria using iron to cycle all types of nutrients. So this little puddle here may actually be a place where bacteria are more busy than anywhere else in the forest during a storm. And it might be what we call a hot spot where you've got lots and lots of elements carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, they're all being transformed here with the help of iron. So this little sign here may have actually taken you to like a, a holy land of nutrient cycling. Maybe that's why that little plant is there. <laughs> you can also see uh, what looks like to be little webs cast by spiders. But if you were to push on that web, you would realize it is not uh, thin strands in a web-like form like you get from a spider's spinneret. No, this web has been spun by bacteria as well. And these are, uh, this is pure sulfur in a sense. It's elemental sulfur that has been covering that leaf. And that's another sign that bacteria, that microbes, probably also microbes uh, that are bacteria, are all together working very busy in that one spot, in this case, maybe to break down leaves and return nutrients to the soil. Now I could go on, so um, I will uh, say, let's go to, if you miss the storm, like let's say you're right now sitting and you're looking outside and you see it starts raining and now you're really enthusiastic to get out there and start looking at stormy phenomena. Well, if you miss it, because you know we all have things to do, I suppose, you can always walk around afterwards and still see signs that the storm has done something interesting. And this is in an urban area. It's in North Carolina. It's just a regular old street tree in a median strip. You can see a car behind it in a parking lot. Even there, you can find some really fascinating phenomena. Here we see, remember that stem flow, the streams on the stems. Here we can see this tree generated so much water, so much water down its outside of its stem that it couldn't all enter the soil. And so what did it do? It created a big puddle 
that then lifted all those leaves up. And then there was enough flow to cause it to flow out to the parking lot. And I could trace this scour of uh, stem flow all the way from the tree out to the parking lot where it then went into a catch basin. So that might be a problem. Trees might not be helping us with stormwater as much as we think they are. But that could be left open for discussion with questions. So as Jesse said, I just returned from Costa Rica where we were studying strangler figs. This is a tree, if you haven't heard of it, that gets, uh, it's a little seed uh, that a bird eats and then it poops the seed on top of a tree. And then that seed starts to put out roots up, up, up in the canopy. Then these roots slowly make their way down. And as they do, they start to wrap themselves around the tree that they're growing on. And as they wrap those roots around, eventually they reach the soil where this strangler fig, this baby strangler fig, can now get strength from soil nutrients. And what does it use that strength to do but strangle its host tree? It doesn't actively strangle it. What it does is it just makes itself stronger. And as the tree underneath tries to grow, it can't. And so it gets strangled by its own growth. It's like uh, using its power against itself. And then what, is, what remains is this fascinating, massive strangler fig. And so we are studying that in Costa Rica. But my point is, is that stormy plants and the questions that we need to address, they're all over the world. This is just a, uh, a fun illustration of some of the um, studies that we have on the subject. And some of many of these I was involved in. And so I've been all over the world looking at stormy plant phenomena. And this is not a brag. This is a plea from your generation for more scientists to get out into the storm and start thinking and playing in the rain, in the snow, in the fog, maybe in a, in a frosty rhyme. Because there's just too much going on in storms that we don't know or haven't even observed or imagined. And, well, it's all too important and interesting. And with that, I will open the floor to questions after I thank Frontiers for Young Minds for uh, allowing me the privilege of being on the editorial board for them to help guide uh, papers through Young Minds and their advisors. And I'll put one more shout out for my uh, illustrators. We have a new science comic. It's called Life on the Limb, a plant-on-plant -plant story where a tardigrade hops on water flowing through branches to introduce people to different types of plants that like to live on plants. Very, very cool, John. Thank you so much for this. And I, I'm so glad, by the way, in my lifetime, that tardigrades, which I grew up absolutely obsessing over as a boy, being a super nerd about biology, have become like in the public eye. I think Ant-Man really did a big job of that, like featuring them as he goes down to the quantum realm. Uh, but just an extraordinary creature. And, and thank you for your uh, relentless enthusiasm for this topic. It is so, so neat. Um, as you said, we're going to dive in with questions. We've got a bunch of YouTube classes. If you guys want to share in the chat, please do. We even had a class chime in just to say that they can't make it today, but they're so excited to watch tomorrow because this topic fits perfectly in their geography and science unit, which is spectacular. Um, Ms. Crouch, Mr. McGill, I will be coming to you guys soon, but John, I'll start with a question of my own, which is, is there a place you've been in the world that has like, I guess the neatest, the most fascinating things that you've ever seen in terms of forests and storms, anything that really jumps out amidst everything that you share with us today. Oh, yes. Uh, so I'm a bit of, a, I, I am impressed by like the plants that live on plants and the tropics and the diversity there. But I'm also mostly impressed that what, what gets me uh, even more excited is seeing like really weird things that we would have thought couldn't possibly exist or happen. And so for me, that's some of these like boreal forests where we can see a forest just in basically store like 50 to 100 millimeters of snow. That's a lot of weight. That's a, that's a millimeter of snow is a liter per meter squared. They store huge amounts of snow. It's mind boggling. And then when they're covered in ice, what's really fascinating to me is that they have enough internal heat or their bark can absorb enough sunlight yeah. that they can even melt the ice from the inside out. And you can get really wild, like you can see water draining under ice, draining down these dark, rich, like streams, 
draining underneath ice on the trunk. At one point, one of those videos even went viral on uh, on Reddit because someone posted it on Imgur. But uh, yeah, maybe I could share one of those. You send it, send it to me after. I'll get it to all our classes. But it's so funny because I grew up seeing things like that. So to me, it was like, this is so cool. But it wasn't like, wow, this is great shakes in the world scale. And it really is a fairly unique thing. Our Thunder Bay class today, you guys are right near the Boreal Forest. I don't even know if it, it, it counts as being it there or if it's just a little north of you. But I'm really glad you highlighted that. Thank you for that. Miss um, Crouch's class, I'm going to come to you guys first in Missouri. If you guys want to unmute your mic, come on in. Eagle Heights, you're good to go. Hey. Hi. Hi. My question is, do you have a favorite water animal that helps the environment? Ooh. Ah, yes. A favorite water animal that helps the environment. Uh, actually, uh, I have a few, and I'm going to try and pick one that I am particularly fond of. Um, okay. I do have a, a a favorite water animal, and and I, it's it's essentially a tardigrade. <laughs> what I love about tardigrades and water bear, well, the water bear is the common term. Um, they are indeed they, they're animals that require a lot of um, of. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah. They're they're what we call myofauna, like just very very small fauna, and um, they require water to really wander around and do their thing. Um, but they also do a lot of really good things for the environment in terms of they can control certain types of pests. Uh, there are great videos online of nematodes, of, of uh, well, of water bears eating nematodes, these things that cause some disease in, in plants. Um, they will even eat each other sometimes, these water bears. They'll like uh, basically, pre uh, yeah, they'll eat each other because... They're in each other's way or they're hungry or whatever. Uh, right. There's a lot of really cool things that they do. And um, as a result of them eating certain things, they become what we call sometimes ecosystem engineers, but we can barely see them. And they're, they, they travel a lot on water and rely on it. And they're so ubiquitous. And this is something that's really hard to really wrap your mind around as something at our scale. But I mean, if there's a drop of water on your driveway, there's probably a tardigrade in it. Nematodes <laughs> are even more, I mean, nematodes are everywhere. I've heard it said that if you like just removed every bit of flesh, muscle, bone, anything, there'd be like nematodes that like did an outline of your body, like little worms that exist on you. I mean, that is true for pretty much anything. So the world is so spectacular at the micro scale, vaguely alarming if you've never heard of that before. <laughs> truly, truly fascinating. Um, Mr. McGill's class, I'm going to head to Thunder Bay. Come on in, guys. Hey. Hello. Uh, my questions are... Uh... Can you drink the bark water and how long did it take for you to grow your beard? <laughs> Thanks uh, for my beard. It took me about like six or seven months and nine months. It kind of was just like, I'm staying here. I won't go any lower, but uh, I would not drink uh, stem flow or through the, the, the bark water. Um, not without like treating it or something, because uh, even though it looks like coffee or tea and I make those analogies, the bark is covered in all types of stuff. Uh, I mean, one of the other favorite water uh, creatures, not an animal, but a water creatures I would have mentioned would be there are some fungi that live in uh, on the bark side and they ride these water flows. So you could be drinking fungal spores. You could be drinking certain types of bacteria. There are some viruses. Um, now, I'll give you an example of one wild fungus that you can find in stem flow and on bark sometimes. It, do, it It's not harmful. It shouldn't be harmful to humans. Uh, it's called a uh, zombie fungus, right? And so there are some fungi that can actually um, get inside of an insect, like an ant or usually, there you go, of <laughs> ophiocordyceps. That's right. Exactly. And these zombie fungi, they like to kind of uh, get into bugs who are hiding under uh, bark cracks sometimes and bark flakes. So you could even swallow, uh, <laughs> you could even swallow cordyceps fungi. But anyway, oh, they, they take over the ant's nervous system. They tell it to go into, I realized I didn't finish the uh, cordyceps fungi story. They, the, the fungi tells the ant to go deep into its, um, its, its ant nest. And then once it's deep in there, the ant is killed by the fungus 
and then creates a mushroom and then blasts the whole colony with spores and takes them all over. Now, if the ants discover that it's been uh, that it's been taken over by a cordycep fungi, they will actually take that ant and throw it out. And then the ant, the fungus knows it's been cast out and it goes, how about we go to the tallest tree and die there and then allow the spores to uh, exactly catch the wind. So there's all types of weird stuff you don't want to put in your mouth um, <laughs> and have to process in stem flow. We actually did, uh, we were doing daily dives, five to seven minute videos every single morning. And our first one was on cordyceps fungi with an amazing scientist who studies them specifically because The Last of Us, which is really popular right now, is the idea of cordyceps if they came to people, which is a terrifying thought, unlikely <laughs> to happen, don't worry. Um, but yeah, even when you go to Parks Canada sites, we're doing this big Parks Canada series right now. We've got a bunch of questions on, should you just drink the water in park sites? Probably not. It's probably best to treat water that you have before you drink it. We're lucky in Canada and the U.S. that we largely you can go anywhere and turn on a tap and get clean, drinkable water. Uh, that's not the case through most of the world. And in the wild, you do run the risk of various things if you just, you know, slap it all up. John, before I do another round of questions, I'm just curious. As we've been losing forests around the globe, as we, you know, turn it into pasture land or uh, degrade it for cities, are we finding water, like storm activity in forests differ? This might not be your area of expertise, but I'm just really curious if we have any understanding of that. Uh, yes, we do. And in fact, it's one of the frontiers questions is, okay, we have forest influence, how much rain reaches the soil. I'll just use rain, but it's, it could be rain or snow. Uh, okay, so forests influence how much rain reaches the soil, but they also influence how much rain goes back to the atmosphere. And so as we lose forests, or even as we change them, we're also changing how they partition, how they, they put some water here and some water there. Um, and we're even changing what kind of disturbances happen to these forests. So this is a, uh, a current open question. There have been a few studies that try to look at how as we go from, uh, well, I mean, if you remove forests, well, then you have a lot of problems. But if you replace them with something else, say uh, there's a lot of invasive locust species in, say, Europe or invasive uh, tree of heaven, Ilanthus altissima, and almost every continent, right? How are they changing where water goes? That's we only I've only been on one particular field study where we looked at that. And that was with the global invader, Tree of Heaven. Yeah. And what we noticed is Tree of Heaven uh, put more water back to the atmosphere and it concentrated more water down to its own stem. And we have questions about whether uh, as we have these uh, ornamental trees that then start taking over all over the place, which Tree of Heaven is one of those that can grow even in the crack of, a, uh, of an old basketball court, right? Are these, these adaptations going to just worsen these effects, right? Cause them to, to go even further than they than their original kind of invasive range. Yeah. And yeah. Fascinating. I mean, it, it's like, it's something that was actually featured in the Green Planet, just throw a plug for that again. Uh, they talk about sort of plants invading man-made and built ecosystems and how the things that we sort of classify as weeds are actually quite amazing pioneer plants and how they sort of go beyond what we're trying, we're trying to stop them. And we're very bad at it as people at stopping plants. Plants will find a way. Uh, I'm gonna head yes, back to our, our classes one more time each before we wrap up. John, time flies and you're having fun in these programs, you know, and I wanna make sure we have an audience to say farewell at the end. So Mrs. this Crouch's class, I'll come to you first. Mr. McGill will wrap up with you, uh, but come back in in Missouri. Hey. Have you ever had to get out of the woods because of severe weather? Yes. What is your favorite part of your job? Ooh, favorite part of the uh, job. <laughs> um, so, I, yes, I've had to get out of the woods for all types of uh, bizarre, severe weather. Um, for um, Okay, so when I was working in Georgia, we had to pretty much try and remove a whole bunch of equipment before uh, some hurricanes came and hit um, barrier islands where we were working. Um I've also uh, had to abandon some projects sometimes and go back to them later because I've been chased out by wild hogs. <laughs> that happened once. Um, yeah, we've seen some 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 wild things. Yeah, the wild hogs one was, I think, the, the most, uh, but that wasn't in clement weather uh, necessarily. That was just uh, invasive big giant pigs. And then um, 
my favorite part of the job is definitely uh, going out and and just poking around the plants. I mean that that's uh, I go out there to collect samples, but I'm usually out there way longer than I need to be because I just get uh, caught up in wandering around and uh, you know peeling back bark and lifting logs and uh, taking pictures of weird things. So that's definitely my my favorite part. And this is why I'm jealous is that when I was a kid, you know, I love what I do. I have the greatest gig in the world next to you. But like the fact that when you're a biologist, you get to play for a living. You get to go out in places that you enjoy being to study things that you enjoy looking at and come back and talk about that. And people pay you for that for the rest of your life. It's like, a, you know, you go to school for a long time to end up with a professor title or a doctor or anything. And it seems really daunting if you're in grade five or six, like our students today, to think that you have that much schooling ahead of you. But at the end of that, you get to work with people all around the world on things that you love and get to travel to amazing places and share that. And if there's a better job description than that, I do not know what it is. So I'm glad we got that. Exactly. And in fact, I would even say, uh, as you look at the kind of what appears to be daunting amounts of education, there's ways to get into that education. So you get to play in the woods and learn or play in farm fields and learn. So, um, or if you want to, you can also sit in front of a computer and model things all day. I mean, that happens too. There are people that like that and we need them. But uh, we, <laughs> we, we featured them before, but we, we, we have a preference here. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> like to go to the field and explore. Exploring by the seat of your pants is the name. <laughs> Um, John, I'm going to head to Mr. McGill's for one final question before we wrap up together. I do want to note again, if you guys want to check out the amazing work uh, of John uh, or of the entire Frontier for Young Minds team, there's so many articles to discover there. This program, like the rest, will be on our YouTube channel, and John is on Twitter uh, in the Wet Plant Lab at Foth Van Stan. Mr. McGill, come on in with one final question. You're good to go, guys. Hey. Um, what's the biggest tree you've ever studied? Yes, biggest tree. Ah, uh, I would say the biggest tree that I've studied was probably it's a, it's probably a tie. That that tree that I just took a picture of and, and showed you all from like uh, Costa Rica was enormous. That strangler fig, I couldn't even tell you how old it is because well, it's hard to date a strangler fig, right? Because it doesn't you know it's been sitting in a tree struggling for who knows how long before it then roots and then you really have the kind of uh, rings to check out to start to do the counting. But so that thing's so old, hundreds of years old, probably. I'm in conjecture here. I have no idea. But then also uh, I worked on some really enormous uh, beech trees. Uh, some beech trees can be hundreds of years old as well. And uh, they just remind me of the trees from... Um, Lothlorien in like Lord of the Rings, you know, like the gray barked trees that get like yellow and uh, with yellow leaves. I mean, this this beech tree was enormous. I could easily see like a wooden platform with an entire set of like sylvan elves playing up there. <laughs> Best nerdy reference to wrap up a broadcast of all time. <laughs> to start, really, everyone should look up Strangler Fakes. There's videos on how they develop. It's like one of the coolest things on this planet. Um, such a neat thing. I'm so glad we brought it up during today's broadcast. John, this has been such a fun time. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and enthusiasm with us today to kick off our awesome Frontiers for Young Minds series. Uh, what we do to end every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our students to join me and say a big thank you and farewell. So Ms. Crouch's class, unmute Mr. McGill's class. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful Bye. day, everyone. Bye for now, guys. See you all soon. <laughs>